Dear participants, welcome to this meeting of the Finnish Society for Natural Philosophy. Today we have as our lecturer Professor Gabriel Sandu, who speaks about the theme What is Logic? He has acted since 1998 as professor at theoretical philosophy in Helsinki University, but is now emeritus. Professor Gabriel Sandu has also many other positions in academic life and is a member of the Finnish Academy of Sciences and Academia Europea since 2011. Professor Sandu has especially studied dependence and independence in logic and game theoretic semantics. Professor Sandu, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation. And also, for this opportunity uh, to present my thoughts on uh, the work, on the joint work I've done uh, with uh, Jakob Hintika and, and below, but mostly with Sin. Uh, he was the supervisor of my doctoral thesis, and then we developed together a system of logic, uh, which had a certain foundational role. So I'll talk about that. Uh, and um, yeah, so the title of my talk is uh, What is Logic? The, the presentation will be in English, but then uh, eventually we'll have a discussion in Finnish. And, uh, so, Jakob uh, Hintika has worked, uh, worked on, uh, on these topics uh, for a long time before also uh, the time when uh, I joined his research team. And uh, so his, uh, uh, his main concern was uh, 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 actually uh, uh, dissatisfaction with our basic logic, which uh, is uh, first of the logic, uh, the, the, the logic that uh, is, is, uh, has been called by some the, the, the logic of science. And uh, uh, during the 70s, uh, Sovietica uh, uh, had uh, sort of revolted against uh, two major trends in logic and uh, language theory. The first trend was, uh, which was very popular then, was, uh, 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 was that according to which first of the logic is a sufficient framework for the semantic representation of uh, the quantification of English sentences, as claimed for instance, by Noam Chomsky, and, uh, but also by others, like Ulf. And the other thesis, the other trend was, uh, first of all, logic is a right or natural logic for the investigations into foundations of mathematics. And uh, uh, as Sintika put it, uh, the catastrophic mistake was to think, in effect, that first of the logic is the full logic of quantifiers. The, uh, uh, uh diagnosis of the situation was that philosophers and logicians were fascinated by first of the logic just because they were uh, fascinated by the wrong kind of completeness. That's a technical notion. And uh, I'll say something more about it. So according to Hintika, they were fascinating uh, uh, with semantic completeness, a result proved by Gödel in uh, 193. Uh, zero and now, and also some other results like the Lindstrom theorem, uh, etc. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in the work I have done with uh, with Sitika, uh, uh, we went against these two trends, and we claimed that the right kind of completeness is another one, and which is called descriptive completeness, and. Uh, uh, we developed a system of logic, which has been called information independent, independent from the logic. And we developed this uh, 
theories about the, the adequacy of uh, this new logic and the uh, inadequacy of traditional first order logic in a series of papers and books, which I which I list here. Uh, so the uh, most of the I say the most of the technical details of the development of first order logic are contained in this last item, uh, the book that I wrote with a mathematician, American mathematician, algebraist uh, man, uh, and then uh, with a computer scientist from Netherlands, uh, Melian Sevenster, uh, independent theory logic, a game theoretical approach. That uh, I also mentioned that uh, independent theory logic also has been, uh, is a very popular topic in a slightly different form in the Department of Mathematics. In, uh, in, in, uh, it has been developed by uh, Van Allen and his uh, research group. So uh, uh, various notions of completeness have been developed uh, during the history of uh, logic and, uh, and they've been developed uh, uh, usually in connection with uh, axiomatization of mathematical concepts. And so formal axiomatics, which, which is different from the axiomatics of the time of Euclid, for instance, is, involves an, uh, a formal language, which is an uninterpreted language. It consists just of dummy symbols. This is the case also with first order language. And uh, this language is provided with different interpretations, uh, and they are called models. Uh, and uh, also, uh, one specifies, uh, in addition to the model, also an effective notion of proof, formal proof. And uh, uh, an axiomatic formal axiomatic uh, theory is, uh, is built up in order, usually, as it said, in order to characterize mathematical, certain mathematical concepts, but not, not also mathematical, it's also for physics, certain mathem uh, mathematical concepts completely. And now the question was, well, what does this completely mean? Uh, and the, the example of a formal language, for instance, we have the language of arithmetic, which uh, contains variables, x0, x1, x etc., usually in an infinite supply, logical constants. These are negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, identity, and the two quantifiers, there is an x, one, for instance, or for all x. These are quantifiers over individuals. So, and then we have non-logical constants. And in the case of arithmetic, we have uh, uh, the number, uh, a name, the name, which is a, it's called a constant, zero. And then we have a symbol for the successor function, s. We have a symbol for, uh, for the function of arithmetic and a symbol for multiplication. So these are, once again, they are just formal symbols devoid of any content. And then one specified, give a, a definition of terms, uh, zero is a term, the constant zero is a term, variables are terms, and then T1 plus T2, this is a term, T1 multiplied by T2, this is a term, the successor of T is a term. And after specifying terms, we specify formulas, uh, or formulae, like T1 is identical with T2, it is not the case that A, A and B, A or B, A in place B, there is an X such that A, or for all X such that A, there is a misprint there. And, uh, and so these are formulas, and, uh, and the particular kind of formulas are sentences, which are form formulas without free variables. Why sentences have a particular role? Just because it is considered sentences, they express something, they claim something. And that is a formal language. And, uh, and then in this formal language, we build up a formal uh, axiomatic theory. And one of them is, uh, for instance, first order piano arithmetic, which was built by the Italian mathematician Piano, Giuseppe Piano. So uh, an axiomatic system, first we axiomatize the underlying logic. So we have logical axioms, for instance, uh, A, well, a and B implies A or things like that for purposes of logic. And then we have also some inference rules like modus ponens. This forms a kind of deductive system 
which is given in an axiom or specifying certain axioms, or if you prefer, again, sometimes introduction and elimination rules. And then we have for the specifically for the mathematical theory considers, in this case, Peano arithmetic, we have non logical axioms. In the case of Peano, we have we use the expressions of the language, the logical and non logical axioms of language, to give the axioms of Peano arithmetic. We have here eight axioms. The first one says that for all x, for all y, if the successor of x equals the successor of y, then x equals y. And so uh, for all x, the successor of x is distinct from uh, the constant zero. Then I have two axioms for uh, addition, two axioms for multiplications, and then we have an induction scheme which says is if a holds of zero, then uh, for all x, if it holds of x, also it holds for the successor of x, then uh, a holds of all, all the numbers. So this is just a syntactical construction, as you see. And the, the, the other notion, which is not syntactical, but it's semantical, is we consider models of the formal language. And as I said before, the models offer an interpretation of the language because the, the so as I, I said, it, the, the language just contains dummy symbols, so they have to be provided with an with with interpretation. The model uh, is a kind of Stanford, kind of, in this case, a kind of world, if you say, if you want, a world which gives a denotation, interpretation to each of the, it, it contains a universe, so model was a universe, D, and then an interpretation function. And the interpretation function is the one which provides a, an interpretation, a denotation for each of the symbols. For, uh, for zero, the constant zero, it associates an element of the domain which stands for zero, uh, which is, sorry, it's a, the interpretation of zero, which is the zero, the constant name in the language is the bearer, if you want, of, of that individual. And then the successor function is assigned, the successor symbol is assigned a, a unary function in the universe, and the, and the plus the symbol is, is associated with a binary function and the, the symbol multiplication. And in this way, every term in the language, every which is a syntactical entity, receives an interpretation in the universe and in the model. So the uh, one of the why we build up the the the, um, the language, but also the the axiomatic theory, because we have in mind we want to describe a certain reality, a mathematical reality, which is represented by the model. So, and that reality that we have, or the mathematician, or the logician has in mind, is uh, is uh, is called an intended an intended model, and so uh, which is the ones we, we want to describe, we have in mind when, when building the, the axiomatic theory. And so they intended the model, the standard model, sometimes called. It's, it's a set, it's a, it, it has a universe, which in this, in the case of Arvidi, is just a set of natural numbers, consists of zero, one, two. They shouldn't be confused with the symbols of the language. Uh, once again, the constant zero, if I, I perhaps misleading, I'm using the same symbol, but they are not. And the interpretation function, well, uh, zero is the associated with the constant zero is the natural number zero with the successor symbol, the successor function, with the plus symbol, the operation of addition, and with the multiplication uh, symbol, the operation of multiplication. Uh, and uh, in this way, once again, every every term in the language receives an interpretation in the model. So, and then we, we define the notion of truth, truth of a sentence in the model. So it's, uh, we, once again, we fix, we fix the language of arithmetic, and uh, then we fix a model of arithmetic, one of its models, if it has more. And then we have, then we, for instance, we say that the sentence T1 plus T2 is identical to T2 T3 or T1, T2, T3 other terms, just in case the interpretation that is associated with T1 plus T2 is the same as the interpretation which is associated with T3. And uh, these are just, the, this is the official of the atomic sentence, 
but then for the more complex sentences, it, it goes in the usual way. A conjunction is true when every conjunction is true. Uh, a universally quantified sentence for all x a is true when a is true of all the individuals in the domain, and so on and so forth. So, and then we have different notions. We have a semantical notion of logical consequence, which is one of the most probably the most important notion in logic, and this is a modal theoretical semantical account, modal theoretical because we use models. And uh, so we have, let's gamma be a, a set of sentences in the language, a formal language, and A, another formal sentence. We say that A is a logical consequence of gamma, and we write it in that way. If uh, for every model of the language, if every sentence of gamma is true in the model, then also A is true in the model. So once again, A is a logical consequence of gamma in the semantical sense that every model which satisfies, which makes true gamma, makes true also A. And uh, we say that A is logically true or logically valid if uh, A, the sentence A is, is uh, true in all models. That is our semantical notion of logical consequence, which is due to Tusky. And the... Uh, but so uh, in particular, in parallel, we have also a, a syntactical proof theoretical notion of, of logical consequence. So, uh, because, uh, as you once again as I try to display here, we, 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 we advance in parallel with the formal axiomatics, which is just a play of symbols, and with the interpretation of the language, which is its semantics. And so, I define the semantical notion of logical consequence and logical truths. But one can define also, it has been done in the history of logic, a uh, uh, proof theoretic, a syntactical notion of logical uh, consequence. And uh, so we have fixed already an axiomatization of, of the logic. We have logical axioms and rules of inference. And uh, as in the formal case, let gamma be a set of sentences of the, of the formal language and A a sentence. And now we say that A is a logical consequence of gamma, but in this kind of syntactical proof theoretical case, if we have a formal proof, a finite sequence, a finite derivation of A from the premises of gamma, and uh, logical axioms uh, uh, use the premises of gamma and use other logical axioms by a chain of legitimate rules of inference. And this derivation of A is also called the formal proof. We say that A is logically valid, if uh, A is just, uh, it just follows, we have a derivation which doesn't use any premises from gamma, the, the set gamma is empty. So once I, I, I repeat myself, I have a notion of logically true, which was true in all models. And then we have a formal notion, a syntactical notion, which is A is uh, logically true or valid if it is derivable in the formal system. And so the, uh, oh, well, I, I, one key, I can give an example of a formal proof. Well, it's uh, piano arithmetic, the formal theory of piano arithmetic is our gamma here, set of sentences, and then we prove in piano arithmetic that uh, one plus one equals two. It's a formal proof. But one and two, you have seen that one and two are not part of the formal language. What is part is just zero and the successor of plus whatever. So one stands for successor of zero and two stands for successor of successor of zero. And then one can do a, a formal proof here uh, uh, just by using the axioms of panel arithmetic and the rules, the axioms of logic and the rules of inference. But I, I'm not going to run it unless you force me to, perhaps later. So we have, I have a couple of examples examples of formal process are just this finite sequence of where I use axioms from the theory gamma, axioms from logic and rules of inference. And that's an effective notion in the sense that it's a finite, it can be checked in a, in a finite number of time whether this is a formal proof or not. So uh, uh, now we have uh, in connection with formal axiomatics different notions of completeness have been formulated, especially 
the pioneering work has been done by Franco and Canada, uh, and and the, they also studied the important uh, the relationship between various kinds of complaints. Uh, and Franco uh, introduced his first notion of when you see deductive completeness of a formal theory, uh, um, and he, he writes that a more important property usually required, if possible, from a system of action is the completeness of the system. But what probably comes to mind first is a conception according to which the completeness of an axiom system demands that the axioms encompasses and govern the entire theory based on them in such a way that every relevant question can be answered one way or another by means of inferences from the axioms. Uh, obviously, assessing completeness in this sense is closely connected with the problem of the decidability of mathematical questions. So if you have, you have T, let's say, let's, let T be this formalized theory of piano arrangement. You have seen the theory, the, the axioms, and uh, the rules of inference. And the deductive completeness means that you have any mathematical query formulated in the language of arithmetic, A, then T has to prove A, you have a formal proof of A, or T has to disprove A. So T rejects A, and that's a deductive completeness. It takes a stand, the theory T takes a stand on every query formulated in this language. And that's certainly uh, an important property, but unfortunately, Gödel in 31, he proved the incompleteness that, that uh, piano the first order piano arithmetic, the theory, the formal axiomatic theory that I presented before, is not deductively complete. And so he showed uh, that there is a sentence A, so that the, the theory PA doesn't proof A. There is no formal proof of A and there is no formal proof also of the negation of A. And that was a big uh, gap, uh, a big blow uh, to, uh, to Pernod Imedi at that time and well, to Hilbert program and so on. Uh, but uh, Frankel also introduced another notion of completeness which turned out to be important for, for the work I've done with uh, Hintika. And that is what he called descriptive completeness or categoricity. And he says that more sharply circumscribed and easier to access is another sense of completeness for a system of axioms, a sense characterized fully by Weber, it seems. According to it, an axiomatic system is called complete if it determines uniquely the mathematical objects governed by it, including the basic relations between them in such a way that between any two interpretation of the basic concepts and relation, one can effect a transition spiming over one one uh, and isomorphic correlation. So, what he wants to say, recall that I said that uh, when we build up a, a, a formal theory like formal axiomatic like analytic, we want to describe a mathematical universe, and that was the universe of natural numbers, the operations of additional multiplication. And so, uh, and when we do that, we have in mind this kind of mathematical reality that I call the standard model of arithmetic. And so what uh, Frankel requires, descriptive completeness, say, indeed, I mean, if a theory is, uh, the theory describes this model, is true in this model, and every other model in which the theory might be true has to be a perfect copy of this standard model. It has to be an isomorphic copy. And, uh, uh, and it, only then you can see that the formal axiomatic theory has achieved its descriptive function. It has described the reality. Why is that important? I mean, think about, uh, well, let's give an example. So if the theory T is descriptively complete, and that is called category, then it's true in the standard model, the model it intended to describe. And if T is true in any other model, and then N is isomorphic. It's a perfect copy of the standard model. They cannot be distinguished. So. In this case, one can say that T characterizes this mind-independent mathematical entity, which is a standard model. Descriptive completely is a semantical notion which pertains to the descriptive function of logic in mathematics. 
there is no reference to any method of proof. All that is needed is a semantic relation of a sentence to its intended model. So, but first order panel arithmetic, so we saw the first order panel arithmetic is not deductively complete. That was shown by Gödel. The first order panel arithmetic is not also semantically complete because it has also, it is true in the standard model, in which you have just all the natural numbers and our operation of additional magnification, but it has also, it's true in some other models, like the ones I presented here, M prime, which consists of a universe, and by the universe, you, have, you may have some intruders. In addition to the natural numbers, you know, one, two, blah, 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 you may have also some number C, which is distinct from all these natural numbers. And uh, uh, obviously, M and M prime, these two models are not isomorphism, and, and thus first order parallel is not categorical, is not descriptively complete. It doesn't manage to fix its reality in a, in a unique way. And uh, uh, and that was, uh, yeah, that is that was known for a long time. So Dedekind, who researched the first time these questions, he, he, he showed that second order Arithmetic. You have to change the logic. You have to have more powerful logic, second order logic, not first order parallel, second order parallel arithmetic is categorically descriptively complete. So, uh, because it allows you to eliminate this kind of intruders that are the non standard, non natural numbers. And uh, uh, so uh, he replaces the axiom of induction, which uh, which was the eight axioms, by a second order axiom, which says that for all sets X, if X contains zero, and for all X, if it contains uh, a number X, if the big X contains a small X, it contains a successor, a small X, and it contains all the numbers. And you can see perhaps how this kind of axiom eliminates, second order axiom eliminates all standard numbers. Because you have first you have all these natural numbers, and after that you have a, an, an infinite non-standard number. But if you, when you have all the natural numbers, all this uh, uh, you take this set X contains just just of the standard natural numbers. It contains zero. Whenever it contains X, it contains also its successor. So it, that it must contain all the entities of the universe. So, uh, uh, it, 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 it rules out that there is a C which is not there. And this second order logic is, is descriptively complete. So, uh, but there is a, uh, another third sense of completeness in the history of logic that that has been called semantic completeness. And it is a property of a deductive proof theoretical system. I presented this kind of formal proof of this uh, proof theoretical system and the notion of formal proof some slides ago. And the deductive, such a deductive system is, is semantically complete. So we're talking about this new sense of completeness if it is strong enough uh, for the corresponding semantics. So the following holds that whenever A is semantically a logical consequence of a theory gamma, also A is a, can be provable. There is a formal proof from gamma. This is a very no important notion of semantic completeness because it reduces the semantical notion of, complete, of uh, logical consequence to this kind of effective syntactical notions. So uh, all semantical model theoretical logical consequences are deductive consequences. In particular, every logically true sentence in the semantical sense, every sentence which is true in all models is reduced just to a manipulation of symbols to, to, a, to, a, to a theorem. It's, it's just proven. So it uh, reduces a semantic notion to a deductive computation notion, probability in a formal system. And that, uh, that is a, a, a nicer, a more manageable notion. And the fact that first order logic is complete has been proven by Gödel. And, uh, and in, in 30, in his doctoral dissertation, 
and and it has when Hindika talks about the fascination of logicians and philosophers with first order logic, he had in mind this kind of completeness. A long tradition in philosophy with Silbert, Gyodar, and Quine has demanded that thematic completeness uh, holds for whatever was to count as logic. Quine has his famous dictum that if it ain't complete, it ain't logic. And he meant this kind of semantic completeness. And uh, first of the logic is, is semantically complete, as proved by Gyodar. And then uh, other has have extended, like Henke has extended this result. And the but there is a price to be paid. So we had, uh, I presented really elementary textbook material in logic uh, and foundations in mathematics, which consists of these three definitions of completeness, descriptive, semantic, and deductive completeness. They illustrate different purposes that logic can serve in mathematical thinking. Descriptive completeness, uh, categoricity of a non-logical theory of T, means that T characterizes its standard models. Uh, and so, uh, it's true, and whenever it's true in any other model, this is a perfect copy of the standard model. Semantic completeness, the result given by Gödel, is a property of a deductive consequence relation. It reduces the notion of logical consequence or logical truth to the notion of formal proof and provability. And deductive completeness of a non-logical theory is uh, it's just a property of the underlying logical system. It decides a theory, decides every question, every query as to. And uh, I repeat again, Hittika's uh, quote with which I started, philosophers have been impressed by Gödel's results, the semantic completeness of first order logic, because they have overestimated the importance of deductive and computational techniques in mathematics. They have been seduced by the oversimplified picture of mathematical <laughs> activity as a mere theory and proof. And the, uh, it is clearly for, it was clear for Hittika that that's not uh, the most important kind of completeness. This is debatable, but uh, what, uh, that, that's the work in which I have been engaged with him. What attracted mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers in the first place to the axiomatic method was a possibility of an intellectual mastery of a whole array of important truths, say, all geometrical truths. A complete axiom system was a means of reaching that mastery. But this kind of mastery is, in the last analysis, a mastery of the models, of the realization of the axioms, and not of the things we or our computers can deductively prove about them. Such a mastery can manifest itself in ways other than a mechanical derivation of theorems from axioms. So, and, uh, so the idea behind the semantic completeness, uh, as you see, is that one needs to step outside the formal representation to semantics. Uh, the, the, if you hold to, because one has to look for truths and truths in a model. So, and this is probably most obvious in the case of quantifiers, because quantifiers like, uh, for all x, every x, and uh, some x quantifiers, especially a universal quantifier, enable us to have principles which deal with infinitary collections, I say, all of a finite connection. But on the other side, if you stick to the, on the other side, you had philosophers, and originally Russell, who said, and also Jensen, and other, I said that when you have a, a representation of this, quantifiers in the language, then you you actually, you give rules of inference and axioms, and then you have the, you, you can manipulate them in a kind of finitistic way, syntactical. But the point of, uh, the point of uh, Hittika, and he was not alone in that, is that this is not enough, you see, the finitary rules in, in proofs, and the rules introduction, elimination, or in axioms for the quantifiers, does not give all the meaning, and uh, and the <laughs> so Hinka promises the real power of 
logic, also first of the logic, comes from the interaction of quantifiers and connection. Uh, and the proof theoretical inferential finitistic meaning of the quantifier, which is given by rules of inference and axioms, cannot exhaust the whole meaning of quantifiers. And this whole meaning of quantifiers come from semantics, from the interpretations and the models. And so, uh, so the real power, once again, I repeat certain things, come from the interaction of dependencies and independences between quantifiers and connectives. And the connection between quantifier dependencies and independencies and certain functions, which are choice functions, scholar functions. I'll say a few, few things about it. Think about what mathematicians do with it, the Weierstrass technique for the epsilon delta definition of continuous function. And the function f is continuous at a point x0. If given any epsilon, greater than zero, one can choose delta greater than zero, so that for all y, blah, blah, blah. So you see, you define a function f at a point x0. So you have to quantify for all points, for all points. And then you have, for all points x0, given any a universal quantifier, for any epsilon, you can, one can choose, you have an existential quantifier, there is a delta. So that for all y, you have a sequence of four quantifiers here. And that is so the real power of, of logic. And uh, so so Hinnika follows Colin before him, is a Nor Norwegian logician. Recognize the existential quantifiers, they are just express certain correlations, certain functions. I mean, think about for all x, there is a y, and then you have a relation between x and y. You can see. Uh, uh, for every piece of meat, there is a price, so I'd say. And what does it mean? It just means, well, instead of the existential quantifier, there is a y. It, it just You have a function, a correlation. There is a function. So that for all x, for every quantity of meat, you obtain its price. Right? That's a trivial example. And if you have more quantifiers, for all x, the second example. For all x, there is a y. For all z, there is a w. So that a certain relation holds, p. And uh, the idea is that the existential quantifier introduces this correlation. So they have a correlation corresponding to there is a y, and another correlation corresponding to there is a w. So the first correlation is y. The function that you introduce f, it depends on x. For all x, there is a y. And there is a w. That's uh, introduces another function which depends on all the previous one before him. It depends on x, y, and z. So, uh, the, and that was the, we, what we realized was the limitation of first order logic. It, 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 and that is, I just picked up a quote from a famous mathematician nowadays, Terence Starr. It seems to me that first order logic is limited by the linear and totally ordered nature of its sentences. Every new variable that is introduced must be allowed to depend on all the previous variables introduced to its left. This does not fully capture all the dependency trees of variables which one deals with in mathematics. So what he wants to say is, once again, for all there is a y, there is a y depends only on all x. Second example, for all x there is a y, there is a y depends only on all x, then for all of that, and then I have there is a w. When you introduce there is a w, it depends on all the previous quantifiers to its left. It depends on all x, there is a y for all that. So, uh, and if you, if you introduce more quantifiers, like in this example, for all x, there is a y. For all that, there is a w. Uh, yeah, what well, that's the example actually I gave before. So what we saw to his Hintika was that, but that was thought of by Henkin, a Polish logician before us in that year, is that you give up, you liberalize first order syntax. You don't allow just this linear orders, ordering of a quantifier. 
but you allowed, you allow, for instance, this kind of branching quantifiers. You want to say for all x there is a y, you have a correlation there. On the second row, you have for all that, there is a w. So you want to say that there is a y depends only on for all x. And uh, there is a w depends only on for all that. If you try to write this in a linear notation from left to right, you cannot do it because you cannot avoid putting one of the existential quantifier to depend on both universal quantifier for all x and for all that. <clears throat> so, uh, Intica used this already in 73 and uh, to express certain natural language sentences, for instance, some relative of each townsman and some relative of each villager hate each other. Well, not a very natural example, but lots of trees has been cut, have been cut to discuss this example. So what he wants to say, you see, for each townsman, you pick up a relative, some relative. That's once and for all. You go to the villager, for each villager, you pick up some relative uh, once and for all. And uh, the, these relatives then a certain relation, hate relation. But you, so you, you just, uh, you cannot express this in the linear notation. So the, uh, and that's, uh, so I, I embarked with Syndica on this program in 60, in 86. And then we, we had a new, we give, we gave up the branching notation and we invented this a new syntax and we call this independent friendly logic. And you have formulas like uh, the first row, for all x, there is a y, for all that, there is a w, but uh, listen, in the linear notation, there is a w would depend on all the quantifiers to its left. But now in the new notation, I put a slash and uh, a set x, y, just means that there is a w does not depend on x and y. So you, you want to outscope X and Y. And so what remains left is just for all that. So you have, and that you can apply to disjunctions, the logical constants. So it's, uh, it's uh, we can express arbitrary dependencies and independencies between quantifiers and correctives, which are much more than what first order logic does. And we do that uh, just using, uh, standard quantifiers and so we gave her interpretation which is called in terms of game theoretical semantics in terms of games of imperfect information again if you look at the first one it's it is interpreted by a, a game two players uh, corresponding to the universal quantifier and the existential quantifier so for all x uh, th that player picks up an individual in the domain there is a y the existential player picks up another individual knowing what is the individual picked up by the universal quantifier before him. For all that, again, the universal quantifier picks up the individual in the domain, knowing the other individual has been chosen before him. And finally, the existential player, uh, W corresponds to W, you know, picks up an individual, but he doesn't know the choice of X and Y before. And so that was, uh, the, this is a game theory interpretation. And the, uh, so in this way, to end up, go towards the end, the sentence, uh, we can express much more ma mathematical properties. For instance, we can express that uh, the universe is infinite and, and, uh, and uh, 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 yes, uh, with the help of this slash quantifier. So, but this, um, so we achieve descriptive completeness for certain notions we can express them. And that uh, we, a series of papers we wrote, and also Sindika in one of his books, we claim that uh, if logic should be our basic logic, because why should be our basic logic restricted just to a linear notation? And uh, we have to accept that our basic logic is semantically incomplete, so we don't have this reduction of logical consequence to provability, to formal proof. Uh, 
and uh, uh, yes, so we advocated the safety for cleanliness and build up a logical system doing that, and uh, uh, and uh, I gave up the notion of uh, the notion of proof is not essential; it's a technical notion. Of proof. So, uh, in the end. Why should we prefer a logical foundation which is based on truth to a logical foundation which is based on inferences? And uh, what, uh, what this example shows that if you, if you want a logical foundation which is based on inferences, then you cannot express certain mathematical notions like infinity. And, uh, and uh, we want our logic to express, to, to accomplish its descriptive functions, to characterize that the mathematical notions. And then you give up this kind of reduction to probability in the form of proof. And uh, that's uh, actually all. Uh, I think it's better for me to stop here. And, and thank you so much for your attention. And uh, you'll answer. Any question if you have one.